Hello, this is Max Gredenchik, Rom from Deep Space Nine, and you're listening to Trek Untold. And welcome to Trek Untold, the Star Trek podcast that goes beyond the stars. I'm your host, Matthew Kaplowitz. This podcast has been around now for about seven months, and that's actually a record for me. The last time I had a podcast was way back in 2009, when I started my first website and my first YouTube channel, The Fight Nerd. And back then, I was covering mixed martial arts and combat sports. So things like boxing, UFC, kickboxing, grappling, all sorts of things that are really completely unrelated to Star Trek. The Fight Nerd podcast lasted, I think, 26 episodes, and I ultimately gave it up because of time constraints, because it's quite hard running a new site, a YouTube channel, and trying to make a weekly podcast. So something had to give, and in the end, that was my choice. The Fight Nerd went on to last eight years, and in between then, I started another YouTube channel, Nerd News Today, which has been around since 2011, and now we're celebrating our nine-year anniversary of that site. So that brings me to today's pretty big announcement. Starting with this episode, the Trek Untold podcast is now going full video. You may have already seen me announce this on my social media earlier this week, but if you're just watching this or listening to it right now, well, here's the news. And especially if you're currently watching this on YouTube, then clearly you already figured this one out for yourself. But for you folks listening on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or whatever, you can now check out this show with full video of myself and the guests I'm speaking to on youtube.com slash nerdnews today. So the way this is all going to work out now is the audio version will continue to go live every Thursday first, and then on Sundays, the video version will be available on Nerd News Today. So make sure to subscribe to youtube.com slash nerdnews today right now if you want to see each episode along with all the other content we make there. And as a disclaimer, this doesn't mean that the podcast is going to be going only in the direction of video. As I mentioned, just to reiterate, we are going to be doing both audio and video right now. And I should also add that not every single episode will, in fact, be full video. That decision will be made by each guest each week, and they let me know if they're comfortable doing video or if they prefer to do just audio. And since I've begun doing this, I've already had a few guests who are more comfortable just doing audio. So be prepared that it's not going to always be exactly like what you're watching right now if you're watching this. It's going to be a mix of both. But of course, at the end of the day, the quality is still going to be the same, and it's going to be the exact same Trek and Told you've been enjoying every single week now. Our first guest to usher in this new era of Trek Untold is one of my favorite character actors of all time, who also just happened to play my most favorite character in all of Star Trek. Today, we're speaking with Max Gredenchik, a.k.a. Rom, from Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Max made his first appearance in the Star Trek franchise way back in the Season 3 episode of Star Trek The Next Generation titled Captain's Holiday. He returned in Season 5 for the episode The Perfect Mate, and both times, he played a Frangie. Surprising no one, Max was called back to play Rom in Deep Space Nine, and we're going to chat today all about the evolution of the character on screen as well as behind the scenes, and how Max developed this Frankie into a very relatable and distinct character unto itself. Mr. Gredenchik lent his voice to Rom throughout the various video game franchises of Star Trek as well, and he did appear on screen one more time in Star Trek, but we're going to get to that one a little bit later on in this interview. In addition to being Rom, Max appeared in Night Court, Sister Act, The Rocketeer, Apollo 13, Sliders, Crossing Jordan, and a whole lot of other shows. And I gotta tell you guys now, speaking as a fan, this was a tough episode, not because Max was a bad guest, very much the opposite of that. It's purely because I was just so starstruck during this episode. I've done plenty of interviews face-to-face with people, and again, I mentioned being the fight nerd in the past. I'm talking, I'm being face-to-face with guys who are about a foot taller than me who could easily crush me with one finger. And those guys didn't really intimidate me, but talking to Max Kredenchik was arguably one of the scariest moments of my life. The minute I saw him staring back at me for the first time on Zoom, words suddenly became a whole lot harder to say, and I had to really try hard to concentrate and focus because, again, Max is one of those guys that if I had the chance to meet him at a convention, chances are I'd be doing backflips about how excited I am. So this episode turned me into a fanboy for the very first time since doing this podcast, and I hope you're going to enjoy some genuine moments of me trying to constrain myself while talking to someone who I admire very much. Oh, and one last note about some more upgrades and changes happening to Trek Untold. Starting this week, we've got a few new ads appearing in the show. Of course, our good friends at Triple Fiction Productions are still a part of everything here, but you're going to start seeing some familiar faces, as well as a few folks who you'll be seeing very soon in Trek Untold. And in the case of this week, it's a guest you're going to be hearing from in just a few weeks, but stay tuned for that later in the show. 
Before we jump into our interview, I want to remind everyone to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Trek Untold. And that's all one word, no spaces. You can also support this show by visiting patreon.com slash trekuntold. If you want to check out some of our merch and put Trek Untold on a shirt, hoodie, mug, sticker, or something else, head on over to teespring.com slash stores slash trekuntold to proudly display how much you like this podcast. And if you do happen to get some Trek Untold merch, go ahead and tag us on social media and let us know you got it. We'd love to see it. But most of all, please make sure to subscribe to this podcast and to leave a rating and a review. There is a lot of Star Trek podcasts out there, as I'm sure you already know, and leaving ratings and reviews helps people find us when they're searching for these types of shows. If you're already following us or offering your support in whatever way you can, be it a follow, review, monetarily, or even just listening today, thank you for the help. There's a family of Star Trek podcasts out there, and we appreciate you joining us here each and every week on the show. So without further ado, grab yourself a root beer, relax, and enjoy this episode of Trek Untold. Computer, access interview file. All right, and welcome back to Trek Untold. And now joining us on the other side of the line, this is a pretty big deal for me because I'm a huge fan of this character and I'm a huge fan of this actor. Uh, and so this is just one of those crazy moments in the show where uh, I'm trying my best to keep it together. Hopefully I can hold it together for a full hour here. But we've got Max Kredenchik joining us today. Max, how are you? Hi, everybody. Everybody listening, everybody watching. I'm okay. I can't complain. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me on your... your, your this is called a podcast? That's yes. where I get confused. Yeah, uh, is this is your first it, time doing a podcast? I think I've done them without a camera. <laughs> yeah, so this without, is basically... Without, without seeing my face. I thought podcasts were just um, audio. Yeah, that's kind of the fun thing about this show is we're trying to do basically both at the same time now. So you're our first guest doing video and audio. So a podcast can be either or? Pretty much, yeah. That's how we're going to sell okay. this today, yeah. <laughs> okay. Learning as I go along. Yeah, thank you, Max, so much for being here today. And of course, folks will recognize your voice and they'll recognize your face as much as they can from Star Trek D Space Nine. And you've had a few appearances in TNG as well. And some of the other things we're going to talk about as much as we can. And we got a lot of questions from fans today because when I posted that I was talking to you, they were just like just as excited as I was. They got a lot of questions for you. So this should wow. be good. So let's jump on right in. And uh, this is a question I like to start all of my interviews with. Uh, Max, what's your earliest memory of Star Trek? My earliest memory of Star Trek, I think when the original series was on, I remember kids coming into class the next morning. It was in junior high school, maybe, or maybe that was in junior high school. And they'd come in and talk about the episode from the night before. And uh, I thought, hmm, that sounds interesting. But I was watching, somehow I couldn't watch it. You didn't have uh, any kind of taping uh, or facility in, in that day, back then. Um, I was watching something with my dad and I couldn't leave that. We couldn't watch them both. So, and I, I, I don't remember what I was watching, but it was nice to be kind of, um, it was me and my dad being together. So uh, I never got to, to, to see it. That was my, that's my earliest memory. And fast forward to a few decades later, then you became a pretty big prominent face on the show. So that's pretty exciting. But uh, before we get to DS9, of course, uh, let's just talk a little bit more about your origins. And uh, you're a New York guy as well, right? You grew up here in New York. I was born in the Bronx. I moved to Queens when I was uh, three years old. And uh, I was in Queens until I went to college uh, uh, when I was about 17. Yeah. yeah. So Ira Bear, Ira Bear, our, our executive producer, was... Uh, also a Bronx boy. Never, he never left the Bronx. Well, he went to Hollywood. I think, <laughs> I think he went from the Bronx straight to Hollywood. So that's a, that's a heck of a trip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The Bronx. Yeah. They don't call it the. They don't call it the Queens. They don't, they don't call it the <laughs> Brooklyn. And they don't call it the Staten Island. It's called the Bronx. Anyway, just the way it is. We don't question it. It's just what we do here. So, when did you first get bitten by the acting bug? When did you know this was going to be what you did for the rest of your life? You think it's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life? I, 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 <laughs> I'm running out of time here. Um, we did plays. We made up plays in high school. There was the senior show we did when we were seniors. And there was a competition called the, the, uh, the Sing. It was called Sing. It was just called Sing. And Sing was uh, the junior, the, the, the sophomore, the junior, and the senior classes. We each come up with this, uh, a half-hour play. 
And I remember doing that. I was part of our, when I was a junior, I was part of our half hour play. And then as a senior also, there was something I, I, I liked about it. And I, and I, they were, when I got to college, they were uh, auditioning for things. So I went to an audition and uh, they cast me. And I went to another audition and they cast me. You know, there was a, there's a comic, Dennis Miller. They asked him what got him interested in comedy, in a comedy career. And he said, uh, well, I, I, I went to some stand up evenings and started telling jokes and they laughed. <laughs> and if they didn't laugh, I'd be an accountant. So I, I became a comedian because they were laughing. It's kind of the same thing because I got good or positive feedback from people. People put me in there. I auditioned for people. They put me in their plays. And uh, some of it was luck being in the right place at the right time. Stuff like that. You know, some guy said, uh, some guy that I knew really, really well, a director, he was doing a play and I, I had sent him my photo and resume, but I didn't think I needed to. But he said, no, it's good you sent it to me because I forgot all about you. And uh, that was luck. You know, that was just dumb luck that I sent in my resume. There's so many times when I didn't send out, you know, a resume. So that's kind of just how the business is sometimes, though. It just comes down to luck. I think so. I think in my case, uh, Look, when I went in to read, maybe jumping ahead here, but when I went in to read for uh, that first episode I did, Captain's Holiday, I could go into the same audition after searching a half hour for a parking spot and be upset, you know, and and not know how to uh, quell that upsetness. And I I, I look like a, a, a not a nice person, but uh, somehow somehow I got a parking spot and I walked in. They 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 made it easy for me and I got in there and I did something, I read something in the cast. So it's, uh, it's luck. It's really, really luck. Yeah. A lot of luck. I think there are other things involved too. And you went to uh, Buffalo State University, correct? No, I went to the University of Buffalo, SUNY. There's two different Buffaloes, I think, right? There are two different Buffaloes. There are. Very confusing. I My dad went to one of those also, I believe. So it's very confusing why there's two different ones. I liked where State was. It was down in a more of a I guess down past the zoo, it was down Elmhurst Avenue. It was in a nicer location. But uh, no, I went to uh, SUNY Buffalo, University of Buffalo for four years. And so again, before we jump into DS9, I wanted to also talk about uh, a little bit of your theater background, because a lot of folks may not know you did some work in theater in New York and San Francisco. And uh, I'm just curious to know what you learned during those years. And uh, in particular, what lessons you learned from your time in theater that you translated over to your work in television and film? Well, one thing that happens is if people keep casting you, it gives you confidence. That's a great thing. I mean, you, you can't fake that. I mean, you go and read for a play and the guy says, okay, you got the part, you know, and when that happens three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 times, you know, then you start to come into the audition with a little bit of um, with confidence and, 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 and it's contagious and it stays with you for a while. Right now, you know, I haven't auditioned for much in in a, in a long time, so I, I I feel I feel confidence going like that. But I think that was one major thing that I had there. And also, an, an, another piece of luck was uh, to become a drama major. You had to have certain fulfill certain uh, had, had to take certain classes. One of those classes was a lottery. There were so many people interested in acting that they. They all pick numbers and the, 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 the teacher, the instructor would, would pick numbers out of a hat. And if your name was picked, you were in the class. Well, lucky, you know, she, she, she picked me. My number was in there. If it hadn't have been in there, I don't know. I don't know which way I would have gone. I was very interested in music. So, but I was too lazy to practice. Don't be lazy. Practice makes better. It's very true. It really, it really does. I think a lot of folks may not know that you have a very, very excellent singing voice. And I'm kind of surprised that you didn't choose to go into the direction of singing versus uh, acting. It's funny you mentioned that because I auditioned for in, in, at the university, actually outside the university, I, I auditioned for Promises, Promises. And the director said to me, you're the best actor for this role, but you're not the best singer for the role. And uh, the guy who got the role came over to me and said, I want you to introduce you to my singing teacher. And that, I, I, I was not a good singer back then. I think I've gotten better over time, especially we have this group called the Rat Pack. I don't know if you're familiar with them. It's Casey Biggs and Vaughn Armstrong. It's a bunch of Trek people. Casey Biggs, Vaughn Armstrong, Jeff Combs, uh, Armin Shimmerman has been a member. Uh, Ethan Phillips has been a member. 
And uh, I hear, you know, I hear Casey sing and I hear Jeff sing and you pick up stuff. I, and I hear Vaughn Armstrong sing, you pick up stuff from, from working with guys like that. So, so I, I, I started, at, I start, when the Rat Pack came along is about when I started taking singing lessons. I, I was serious about it. So, and I hope to get back to that soon. It is pretty funny you guys named yourselves the Rat Pack as well, because when I first heard your voice, I thought to myself, Max sounds a lot like Frank Sinatra. So that's a pretty perfect uh, <laughs> name right there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't name the group. I, I, w I wouldn't have put that group together. I would never have put us five guys together. But um, <laughs> Creation did that, and kudos to them. <laughs> kudos to them. I think, it, I think it's something that worked. Have you, have, the op have you had the opportunity to see us? The only time I've been able to actually hear you guys was at the end of the D Space Nine documentary, what left what we left behind. Oh, okay. okay. And so yeah. and I, you know, at that point I didn't know that you could sing in particular. I didn't know that Casey could sing, and I was just like blown away by the performance and how good it was. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to hopefully a cast album, maybe. <laughs> we'd like we'd like to do that too, but it's too we're we're all over the we're all over the planet, you know, so it's hard to get us together. But uh, but the Casey can really Casey has a gorgeous voice. Yeah. So one of the uh, performances I remember actually first seeing you in before I even knew you were on Deep Space Nine was in The Rocketeer. And uh, you played- Oh, God. This, yeah, villainous goon, uh, some henchman who then gets uh, basically offed by a character named Lothar, who is played by Tiny Ron, who we all know later would be Mayhardu on DS9 also. Uh, that's you, right, that's right. What year? This is 1992, you say? I think that was 92, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, do you remember anything about working on The Rocketeer or being with, uh, or your first time meeting Tiny Ron? I don't. And, you know, it was what we did with Tiny Ron was so fast. I don't remember how tied up I was. I'm in traction. Yeah, you're pretty, right? pretty heavily bandaged up in a hospital bed. Yeah, I mean, I'm in traction. So I, it was just not a situation where I would, we would speak that much to each other. <laughs> I think you, I think a few years later when he was May Hardu on, on D, DS9, I think we talked a little bit then. But again, I think he was wearing a lot of makeup and it, it may have been difficult. Yeah, he had a ton of makeup. That was a big deal at the time for that movie was just how much makeup he had. Because it was, it's, it's pretty gruesome for, for me as a kid watching that. I was pretty scared of him. <laughs> Still am from that scene. The, the Rocketeer. Yeah, yeah, that was, uh, that was my first big, um, my first big, like big budget movie. It was very, very exciting. Very exciting. What was my name in that? It was like Ernie or something. Uh, Is that Ernie or, some... or Wilbur or something like that? Wilbur. It was, it was Wilbur. Wilbur. Okay. I'm mixing up movies. Yeah. <laughs> it was Wilbur, I think. And Will Murr. Will Murr. Okay. W I W I L M E R. And I was stealing the rocket. And they put me in this period style suit. I mean, beautiful cloth. I mean, they made it. They didn't go to a store and buy it. They 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 they, they bought the cloth and made it themselves. They take it to show the director, you know, what they did. It's, it's gorgeous. It's just gorgeous. And the director looks at it and says, no, 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 no. That's, that's, that's not what we want. He's, he's, been, he's been running around with this rock. He's been, he, he's been trying to es escape from the people coming after him. It has to look a little, a little disheveled. And, and they, they kind of went like that. <laughs> he says, no, 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 no. And he, he asked me for the jacket. I give him the jacket. The director takes it and starts crumpling it crumpling it, crumpling it. And then he throws it on the floor and starts stamping it, stamping on it. And he picks it up and he says, that's how, that's what I want. That's how it should look. And uh, yeah, I, I, I thought, man, it's a thousand dollar suit. It's gotta be, it's gotta be a thousand dollar suit. But uh, he wanted the authenticity of, of what was going on. That was a nice thing for me to see, that that was important to him. And I also remembered seeing you in Sister Act. Again, this is another movie where you basically get killed in like the first 20 minutes. But uh, you're also right. in Sister Act. Yeah. Did you ever get to meet yeah, Whoopi? Just I, curious about that. I didn't, I didn't make it to Sister Act 2. Yeah, I <laughs> did because she, she had to be around when I was shot. When I was, when I was shot, she had to be there and, and kind of see the smoking gun, I think. So once I was killed, she steps into the room. So she, so she was around waiting to get her angle on that. She was very nice to me. Trek Untold will return momentarily. Trek Untold is brought to you by Triple Fiction Productions. If you're a Star Trek cosplayer looking for props or a toy collector looking to spice up your shelves, Triple Fiction Productions has you covered. Triple Fiction Productions produces affordable and unique 3D printed Trek inspired products from the original series, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise, and the movies. 
You can expect the same amount of care and attention to detail in any of the items in their catalog, whether it's a prop replica for use in a fan film, or part of a cosplay, or accessories and playsets for figures from Playmates, Migos, or Diamond Select. Own your very own tricorder or phaser rifle with working lights, the bridge of the Enterprise E for your Playmates figures, or any other item from countless species and ships from the Star Trek universe. All products are 3D printed in the USA and are constantly evolving and improving based on fan feedback. To learn more about their products, visit them at triple-fictionproductions.net or on Facebook at facebook.com slash triple fiction productions. Triple Fiction Productions, taking Star Trek where no 3D printer has gone before. Hello everyone, I'm Armin Shimmerman. Perhaps you know me better as Quark from Deep Space Nine. As your favorite Ferengi, I'm here to promote a sale. It's not self-sealing stem bolts, but my new novel, Illyria. And the first book is called The Betrayal of Angels. Some of you may not know that aside from being an actor, I'm also a novelist. My newest novel is a mystery set in 1583. Its heroes are the historical characters of John Dee, who was a spiritualist, a book collector, and a spy. With him is an unsuccessful playwright named William Shakespeare. Their mission is to investigate a nobleman who happens to be Count Orsino from Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. The book employs comedy, history, and fantasy to tell a page turner of a story. The adventure is a trilogy, and the first book goes on sale November 5th, which happens to be my birthday. It reads a lot like Sherlock Holmes, or like one of my favorite shows, Homeland. Please check out my website at www.armandshimmerman, get the name right, .com, or you can get it directly from my publisher at www.jumpmasterpress.com. You can buy it either as a paperback, a hardback, or an ebook. So why don't you check it out and judge for yourself, or better yet, Give it as a gift to someone. I know they'll appreciate it. Uh, disclaimer, no Latin I'm accepted. We now return to Trek Untold. So let's jump into your Star Trek time. And uh, your very first appearance was on Star Trek Next Generation, Season 3, Captain's Holiday. That's and in right. that one... Jan January of 1990, we shot that. Yeah. Oh, okay, you can remember the actual dates. That's impressive. <laughs> I do. It was pretty much very close to a year after I arrived in uh, Hollywood. So I, was, I arrived there January 23rd, 19, uh, 1989. And January 1990, uh, I got the call for this thing. Yeah. And at the time when you auditioned for this part, did they tell you you're going to be wearing this crazy alien makeup at all? Or was that kind of a surprise to you? I don't know. It wasn't a surprise because... I, I, my, I think my roommate had a video of Ferengi. He had VHS tapes of uh, Next Gen. So I got to see, I got to see what the Ferengi was. I also asked him, I think I said, I have this audition. How should I handle it? And how should I handle it? And he looked at the, looked at the lines and went. <laughs> and he started to say the lines like, like the original three Ferengi. In um, what was the first, uh, the seventh episode, um, last outpost? It Is might it have last been the, outpost. It might have been the last outpost. I can't remember off the top of my head, but that, that's one with Armin Sherman as well, right? Yeah, that was that was Armin was one of those three Ferengi. I knew it wouldn't be anything normal. Yeah, but uh, I asked my agent, "What's a Ferengi?" And she said, "You know, go go look, go look at go pick up the sides. The sides are the are the pages that you're going to read at the audition." Uh, so I went to get the sides, and I, 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 I didn't know anything more than I did before I went to get the sides. And then I, I, I got uh, my roommate to, to do a little demonstration, and it freaked me out a little bit. I said, I can't go into a, a bunch of producers, you know, producers, executive producers, supervising producers, 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 producers. I can't go in there and do that. He said, well, I, I called my brother, Barry. You know Barry? I do happen to know called, of him. <laughs> I, I, I called Barry and, and I said, this is what I have to read for a Ferengi. And this is what my, uh, this is what my um, roommate told me I, I should do. He says, your roommate's right. <laughs> They're very exaggerated characters. They represent pure profit motive in the 24th century. And uh, I went into the audition 
And I said, you know, to be honest, I don't really know what a Ferengi is, but this is what my roommate and my brother told me a Ferengi is. And I read the lines. And when I was done and, and, and I said, thank you. And they said, tell those two guys, we may have jobs for them. So I knew that I did something sort of right. And I'm all, it was only like an hour later that I caught the call that they wanted. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Just Do you remember- luck, just, just luck, yeah. <laughs> Do you remember what it was like to be uh, in the prosthetics chair for the first time and getting your face done and getting all that makeup on? Do you remember that process at all? Or, or I should ask also, was that your first time doing heavy prosthetics? I was on a show called Night Court and they gave me some teeth. They gave me some buck teeth. Uh, the punchline was his teeth are so buck he could eat a sandwich through Venetian blinds. <laughs> And that's, they actually had to change that line, I think. <laughs> I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't say it. Maybe you have to cut it. I don't know. There was something about Venetian blinds. It was a trademark or something. So do you remember the very first time that you got tested and made up in the Frankie makeup, the first time you ever wore those particular prosthetics on Star Trek? I remember looking at the stuff, and, and, and I remember thinking I was a tough guy. <laughs> and I could wear this makeup every day, you know, if I... You know, whenever you, well, I don't know from all actors, but a lot of actors, me certainly included, if you have a line in an episode of something like, here's your soup, Mr. Hines, you think that, you think that if you do it just right, (laughs) if you do it just right, they're going to have you back. (laughs) You said, you said that line, here's your soup, Mr. Hines. You said that so brilliantly that they will have no choice but to say, oh my God, this guy, this, this guy is incredible. Even if your line is the most, is the simplest possible line. So here I am. I have a lot of lines in this episode. I wonder if they'll ask me to do this. I wonder if I'll have a future here. It would be the same with anything I did. You know, uh, I wonder if, I, if this will keep going on this show. And I think I had started to talk to Patrick Stewart about the makeup and he thought it was tough. And uh, so my first time in the chair, by the time I got to the chair for the first time, I, I was thinking all these thoughts. And I thought, uh, I thought I could, I could do this. I, if, they, if they ever want to give me another role on, on, on this series as a Ferengi, I think I can do this. And Tuesday, I was much less confident. <laughs> <laughs> and by Wednesday, I was like, again, they're going to put that glue on me again. I got to wear it for 14 hours, 15 hours. Oh, my God. And then th- Wednesday and Thursday, I, I don't know. I don't know. Ow! I had to take it off at night. I had to baby my face. And yeah, it was, it was, that was my experience. It was, uh, <laughs> I, I thought, I thought I was really full of bravado. I could do this. Uh, by Thursday, I think, Wednesday even. Nah. So that was the first time I had the, you know, the makeup on. I remember, I don't know if you know Doug Drexler. He uh, was an uh, effects guy on, uh, on DS9. Back then, when I was on TNG, he was a makeup artist. He was one of the makeup artists. And the makeup took about three hours at that time. When I started, it took about three hours. Suddenly, uh, my makeup person uh, had to go do somebody else. And Doug Drexel worked on me. <laughs> and, you know, I know it's getting close to three hours. He loved, he loved doing that makeup. He he, he just enjoyed it so much. He said, he said, you know, I love doing it. I'm, he, he's talking to me as I'm in the chair. You know, I really like doing this. Look, I can do this here. I can put a little more red here. Look how that looks. Isn't that nice? And now it's 310. <laughs> it's three hours and 10 minutes. And then it's 315 and 320. I wasn't very fond of him that day. You know? <laughs> so. Very passionate about his makeup. That's for sure. Passionate about everything he does, I think. That's what yeah. makes him good. That's what makes him good. Yeah. Uh, in this anyway. episode, too, you're, it's basically like kind of like a, a Maltese Falcon meets Star Trek kind of story. I felt like your character was almost like the, the Peter Laurie, if you will, in that episode. What a compliment. What a compliment. Great. And, great uh, Peter Laurie. Austrian. Yes. Austrian. Austrian actor. Yes. Yes, sir. And uh, again, as we so. mentioned, he used to do this episode with Patrick Stewart. And it's basically primarily yourself, Patrick Stewart, uh, the actress who I can't remember whose name right now, uh, who played Vash. Um, but I'm just curious about what it was like oh, to be Vash. around Patrick Stewart as well. You know, this is... Um, the captain oh. of yeah, the captain of the Enterprise and Vash as well, another actress who came in because this episode and she continued to be on the series here and there. 
Um, but yeah, just oh, what do you she remember about that? She, she did some DS9 episodes. She was, yeah, she right? was actually on season one of D Space Nine in the episode with Q. Jennifer Jennifer Hetrick, I believe her name. Yes. Yeah. That's, do you have any Do you have any memories of being on set with Patrick with, and Jennifer? When I met Patrick, Michael Westmore had to work on my uh, prosthetic uh, in the makeup lab, and that took a while. And uh, I, I I went to wardrobe and uh, had to be fitted for an out a costume. And uh, that took a while, and uh, it was January in Los Angeles, and it was a beautiful day. The, the actors, LeVar and uh, Marina, I think, and Patrick, they were hanging out outside the stage because it was just a, such a warm, a beautiful day in January. And uh, we're going from wardrobe, the person who was assisting me, we're going from wardrobe to the makeup lab, and right on the way, these guys were hanging out. And my, the, the person assisting me says, I think you should meet Patrick because you're going to be working a lot together. And she introduced me. And he shook my hand and he said, Max, you're going to be having a very rough week next week. <laughs> if there's anything I can do to make it easier for you, anything I can do to lighten your load, please have that request come through me. I seem to have some clout around here. <laughs> so... That's uh, that's how I that was my introduction to Patrick Stewart and uh, <laughs> yeah he's been he was nice that day he was nice that shoot and he's been nice to me uh, ever since and uh, I only have nice things to say about that guy. He's, uh... We have a question from one of our listeners that's Andrea Levine and uh, she actually did have one more thing to talk about with Next Generation before we jump to DS9 and that's she wanted to ask about your deleted scene from Star Trek Insurrection, which if folks don't know that's where you're with uh, Jonathan Frakes and Marina Sirtis inside a library and it's a fun scene library. would have been better to be in the bathtub with them wouldn't it oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, they didn't do that they put me in the library yeah um we should also I, add that I, this time you weren't a frangie you were also a trill for the so you weren't a frangie for like the only time in your career thank god thank god yeah i was I, I did i just had the spots on me i just had the spots on me and they're in the library and the library is a place of quiet and concentration and uh, suddenly we start acting like teenagers. Yeah, they're getting closer to this planet, Baku. Yeah, they're getting they're getting closer to the Baku planet. And as they approach the planet, everybody's acting more and more like kids, right? Yep. Because uh, uh, I think Worf has something like pimple or something. Yeah, he starts getting acne and. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's all this. Everybody's going back to like junior high school. <laughs> and so my one and only job. When they come into the library and start giggling or whatever they were doing that was teenage-ish, was to blow a spitball at, at, at Frakes. And uh, I, got, I had a really nice little hollowed out uh, bick, you know, and I hit him like nine out of 10 times. <laughs> the one time, the one time he missed, he got upset with me. So I couldn't help that. I couldn't help that. I think, I think if you're batting nine out of 10 in the major leagues, I think you're getting, you know, 50 gazillion dollars a year, you know. I don't know if that's why he cut it out. I, I never got to talk to him about it. But I think they probably didn't need it. Yeah. So as we mentioned, that was your first time being a trill. You got to play yourself in the uh, series finale as well. But, uh, you know, moving on to Deep Space Nine now, we do want to mention that obviously you're Rom, you're another Frankie. And I've got another listener question. This one is from Brian Narowski. And oh. he, he wanted to know if you were happy being cast as a Frankie for the third time in your Trek career, or if you really wanted to have been another alien species. Hi, Brian. Hi. Thanks for the question. Well, the main thing you want to do as an actor is work. So almost any way that work comes, it's okay. If they wanted me to be a Ferengi a fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh time, I'd be, I think I'd be quite happy about that. But if I had to be another species, a trill would be good because, you know, it's like, it's like, what is it, 20 minutes maybe? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to say Terry Farrell didn't suffer, you know. <laughs> uh, but it's a, it's a lot faster with the makeup. Although, you know, to be honest, the Ferengi makeup, you get into that Ferengi makeup, there's a, kind of a, it's kind of a ritual. You're becoming the character as the makeup goes on, you know. So it's not, it's not that bad a thing. It's really not that bad a thing. And it's, the makeup started out at three hours. Then in, the, in I think in the end of the second season, they got it down to two and a half. And then by the end of the third season, they got it down to two. And uh, just, just to put that in perspective, when Cisco, when, when Avery playing Cisco, 
was bald, they gave him an hour for hair. It was it was on a call sheet. Avery Brooks, one hour hair. <laughs> so a lot of that time was just to make sure everybody was there in their place and ready ahead of time. When the makeup was three hours, um, they had given me the wrong call time. Wasn't my fault. Wasn't my fault. They'd given me the wrong call time, and they needed me in makeup immediately. And uh, they got two two of the makeup artists to work on me, both female. <laughs> and they did me in fifty one minutes. How does that work? This is when this is when the makeup was taking three hours. And uh, I came in the next morning and I said, if, if two of you can do me in 51 minutes, three of you, if you extrapolate that out, three of you can do me in 14 minutes, 14 minutes. And four of you working together on my face, four of you would actually get me done in theoretically in minus five minutes. We'd actually save, we'd actually make time. We'd create time. That was my, that was my, they didn't want to hear it. I thought that was a, I thought we should try that at least. That's some excellent Frangie math though. I'll give you some credit for that. That's like Frangie quantum physics. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So let's break down a little bit of acting theory for Rom because uh, I've always found the character to be very interesting in how he evolved from when we first saw the character and initially with your voice too. Uh, you know, that character first kind of had more of your voice. And then as the show went on, we got the kind of the ROM voice. I don't really know another way to put it. On but... DS9. Yeah, Deep Space Nine. So... What did you feel? Did you have any opinion about the voice on Next Gen? You know, I, I actually was kind of interested in that voice too, to be honest, uh, because I was trying to figure out what the inspiration was for it. Maybe you can tell me what you went for inspiration wise, because it felt to me like it was meant to be more of like a, a traditional uh, I want to say like a film noir style villain. Like, again, I mentioned Peter Laurie. So I kind of felt yeah. there was something in there that was like very uh, scheming, nefarious. And similarly with the body language, I kind of read it as a lot like Joe Egypt from Maltese Falcon. So um, on that note too, actually, yeah, like how did that character evolve from TNG and your inspiration for the character in TNG versus once you got to Deep Space Nine? How did all these things come together and evolve into what we all now know and love as Rom? When I started out with the teeth, this probably goes back to next gen. When I started out with the teeth, I wanted it's kind of the same thing with the makeup, you know. Uh, I can I can take it, I can take it. <laughs> I wanted the teeth hurt a little bit, and I wanted to sound like I normally sounded, just with those big teeth. I I thought I could make myself sound like me, and uh, the teeth wouldn't be a big deal. Well, when I was talking like me, they began to hurt. And I had that snaggle tooth that hits me. And where, and this, I don't remember which way, which way. I think it was this way. Maybe. The snaggle tooth hits me and the, 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 the teeth take up a lot of room in your mouth. Then I thought, I don't know where this came from. Maybe I was watching some show or something. But then I thought, I'm going to go. Maybe it came with the costume because the costume made me walk a certain way. I'm not going to fight the teeth. I'm going to let the teeth take me where they take me and so and and that meant not hurting i was looking for a way so that they didn't hurt me so much when i opened my mouth like this and spoke a little slower and had the sound come from the back of my throat then they didn't hurt because i'm over pronouncing things and i feel like i have more time to say what I'm, what I need to say. Yeah. And very little pain, uh, compare relatively speaking. So did I answer any question there? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, you know, when I, when I, when I hear the ROM voice, especially later on, when you're doing that version of the ROM voice, it almost reminds me a little bit of like the cowardly lion, like Ray Bolger's cowardly lion from well, the of Oz. That's my, that was, he's my inspiration. Yeah. I'm, I'm afraid it's too much. My fear is it's too much like him, but yeah, he was uh, my inspiration in that uh, in, in, in in get in that voice. Yeah, because that's always you know whenever I try to imitate the wrong voice myself, I always end up kind of sounding like the cowardly lion. It's, it's for me when I do it, it's like workers of the world unite. But I'm too cowardly lion. <laughs> well, that's pretty good. I think that's pretty good. Bravo. Yeah, well, thank you. I've been working on that for quite some time. Thank you. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I was going to actually ask you for a critique of my wrong voice, but that's where I've got it. So. Basically, the key, it sounds like to you, is kind of to have it more in the back of my throat back and of slow throat. down probably, right? 
back of the throat. Yeah, and Rom is slow. Yeah. Rom is, you know, why? Not why, why? You know, it, uh, there's a slowness about him, a deliberateness about him that is, uh, yeah, yeah, that fit, that fits, that makes that fit for me. So for me, it does. See, I always felt there was a lot of musicality in Rom's voice as well. And this comes back to your background in singing here. Um, in fact, there's, I actually was watching some episodes to prep for this interview, and there's one that you did, um, I have it written down, but I can't remember which one it was here. But there's one episode, uh, it was The Magnificent Frankie, actually. And mm -hmm. Quark is telling Rom that your mother's, Moogie's been abducted and all this stuff is happening. And you're reacting to the lines and your reactions are, no, no, <laughs> no. That's and you're right. going up in scales each time. So there was a lot of oh, like I rhythm see. and cadence in your character yeah. too, like, um, was that something you consciously did, or is that something that's kind of just kind of happened? Well, I, 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 I probably, I, I probably didn't just happen. I probably, you know, uh, Armin and I would rehearse. So, uh, and 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 Aaron, God bless him, uh, uh, Aaron, Aaron and Jeff Combs, we'd all get together and rehearse stuff. So, it probably came out of a rehearsal that we were doing. I, I, I would imagine, and and nobody said that sounds dumb. So I. I I, you know, or that sounds wrong. So I used it. Yeah, yeah. I would like to see that again. No, it was very good. I, I was, I didn't notice it the first time around. I'd watched it, and then I just saw it again, like I said the other day, and I was like, he snuck that in there. That's good. <laughs> hey, very good, very good um, uh, imitation. Oh, thank you. Thank the you so much. The sincerest form, the sincerest form of flattery. Thank you. <laughs> So, and then you mentioned also that the costume kind of dictated how you perform too. Uh, and Rom, of course, he wears two different outfits ultimately in the show. He's got the Frangie outfit and then later the Bajoran engineering outfit. Uh, so which one did you prefer to wear and how much of that really affected your body language for Rom? Well, the, the, the wardrobe, uh, uh, like the teeth, it's something to work. Or there's a stiffness to it, at least for me, something to uh, uh, work with, you know. It's, yeah, yeah. The character, the character comes to life. You know, you sit in the makeup chair and they start dabbing stuff on you, and, and then you you're you're running lines with Armin or Aaron, rest in peace. Uh, you're running lines with Chase or wh whoever, and and it starts to you know you just you, you you practiced at home maybe or, or or you rehearsed with the group and and you start getting into it, you start getting into it. And then you look in the mirror and you start to see Rom, more Rom than Max. And, and then one of the last things you do is you put the, the wardrobe on and it, 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 that's, that's who the guy is. That's who the guy is. Uh, I love him to pieces. <laughs> and, and, and it, you know, so he walks like he's, he's a little stiff when he walks, but he's trying to catch up to his brother and tell him something or ask him something. And, and he's afraid his brother is not gonna like it. So, so it's like this forward and then a step back, this forward and then a step back. Makeup wardrobe, huge part of the character, I would say. I, would I say. always appreciated the physicality of it. And you, know, you mentioned how Rom is always kind of taking a few steps backwards. He's always behind his brother. I always thought that the physical parts of the character really helped to uh, exaggerate the mental aspects of how Rom felt. Yeah, yeah. As, as we've heard Rom say, in fact, uh, it wasn't that he ever had, uh, what was the line? It's, um, I just lack confidence. That's I just exactly lack it. confidence. Yeah, I've it's like, been, I've never I've been dumb, brother. I just lack confidence. Yeah, I, I've always felt it's such a powerful line. It really spoke to a lot of what Rom was physically and mentally as a character. So yeah, I, I always appreciated what you did with just having him basically show that mental part of it through his physical emotions. You know, thank you, because that brings us all the way back to the first question when I said I used to be confident. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> go, you know, going around to auditions and you're getting cast and it gives you, it gives you confidence. So the question now I have is, can you manufacture that consequence, that, uh, that confidence? Can you go to auditions, be rejected and still be confident? I don't know. If you find that out, call me. Okay. I would like to know. I would like to know. I'd like to know too. If anybody else out there knows, do let us both know. On the topic of Aaron Eisenberg, since you brought him up, we had a lot of folks who wanted to hear some Aaron Eisenberg stories. Uh, in fact, the first person to ask was uh, Yam Yogurt on Instagram, May Young. Uh, so <laughs> that's her name. Yeah, great, great Instagram name there. Um, so yeah, can you tell us uh, just any stories you've got of Aaron? Because at this point now, we're uh, a year since his unfortunate passing. Um, and his memory is still very much alive with us today. But yeah, do you have any great stories about Aaron you could share with us? 
I, 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 I think I'm blanking out. I've been talking about Aaron a lot, a lot, a lot. He was a great guy. Um, he was a great guy. Uh, we were in Germany together once. And uh, we were going, I want to say that Seven of Nine was on stage. It was a small stage, though. It, it, my memory is so, I don't know how good it is, but uh, she was on this little stage. And we're standing not that far away from her, but in the back of the room. He said, if Aaron Eisenberg married Seven of Nine, he'd be Aaron Eisenborg. <laughs> I thought, wow, crack me up. <laughs> he cracked me up. That's pretty great. <laughs> so, that was his, uh, we, yeah, we used to be on stage together. We used to get into makeup and wardrobe and makeup and be on stage together. Yeah, we had a lot of, we had a lot of fun. We missed that. You know, a lot of people talk about Star Trek as this great, crazy sci-fi series, but you look at Deep Space Nine and it's very much about family because you've got Captain yeah. Sisko and Jake, you've got yourself and Nog. There's a lot of familial elements to the show. So yeah, yeah, I always appreciate that part of it. And uh, you know, how, how did you feel about working with Aaron as your son on the show too? I mean, how, how did that relationship grow between yourselves off camera? It worked like this. I would tell him something. He would say, I'm not going to do that. And then I would say, why not? And he would say, it's a dumb idea. And I would say, well, what do we do? And he'd say, let's call Armin and he'll, he'll be the negotiator. <laughs> I've been talking a lot about Aaron. I don't know, I'm sure there's, um, it was just, uh, he had a memorial service a, a few weeks after he died. And uh, we went, my wife and I, Karina, we went over there. And uh, one of the things I said about him, because I sit next to him when we do conventions, almost all the time, I sit next to him. And I'm, maybe he's on this side of me, Chase is on the other side of me. But we sit together, talk to the fans. And uh, at, 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 at his memorial service, I said, Aaron was fan friendly before that term was invented. Because he was. And, uh, you know, we'd be at our table. Someone would want a photo with the both of us. They'd, Aaron would say to me, come on, let's get a photo with this guy. <laughs> yeah, always giving to the fans. Always. So Star Trek Toy Collector on Instagram has a question that I was going to ask you anyway, because I'm also a big fan of Star Trek toys. Uh, he wants to know what you thought about your Star Trek action figure. Oh, hi, Star Trek Toy Collector. Thank you for the question. Uh, what did I think of my Star Trek action figure? I, well, I couldn't believe I had an action figure. <laughs> That's, you know, you... you uh, You've arrived when you have your own action figure. I don't know where you've arrived, but you've arrived <laughs> to some, some place, some some place that not many actors get to arrive at. And I thought I went down. I drove down about an hour south of where I lived in, in Los Angeles area, and uh, there were boxes of these figures for me. I, I couldn't believe it all. So they had about thirty-five or so figures. I bought six. Big mistake. I should have bought all 35. That is my one regret about that Star Trek figure. Otherwise, uh, otherwise I'm just amazed that they that I have my own figure. Rob Whitaker wants to know who came up with Moogie and if it was always meant to be like that or if that was uh, in the script or if that was an ad lib from yourself. Rob, is it Rob? Thanks for the question. How else would you pronounce? Rob, I wish you could talk back so I would know how to pronounce it, how you would pronounce it. How would you pronounce that? How else? It's a moo. It's a definite moo. And then a gi, or it could be a g, moo g, I guess. Either way, but moo g. <laughs> <laughs> I think he specifically is asking because he likes how you said it. Moo g. Moo -g. Rob, where are you? There you are. Moo g ain't bad. Moo g ain't bad. Moo g. Muji, Moogie. Mm, there's something about Moogie. Uh, that, that, uh, yeah. Matthew, which do you like better? Muji or Moogie. Huh, it's, a, it's an interesting yeah. acting choice you made with the G sounds there. So I, that's tough. They're both pretty good, actually. They are both pretty good. I don't know how else to pronounce it. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why. That's why. Uh, oh, I could have just said Moogie. Hey, Moogie. Hi, Moogie. Yeah. Hey, Moog. How you doing? Yeah. How's it going? Yeah. What's up? Uh, Could have done Moogie. Yeah. 
Rob, I don't remember what I was thinking, but probably like many things, I tried it out in, in somewhere in the rehearsal and maybe people laughed or somehow responded positively to it. So, so just a choice you made but, and it worked out pretty well. Yeah. 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 I think so. I think so. Yeah. So we know that in Star Trek, the script is usually the lay of the land and there's not really any jumping away from it. And uh, when we spoke to Chase Masterson a little while back, she mentioned that the very first time and the only time she ever saw an ad lib happen was uh, on the episode with Robert Picardo. And that's the one where Rom and Lita <laughs> first get together. And so I was, curious I, if, I was curious if you remember any other moments where any other actors, maybe yourself included, were able to actually ad lib something and get away with it. No, uh, well, I, I would say that this is important. I think that uh, I think as a, out of respect for, I think Gene Roddenberry, regarded the writer's wor word as so sacrosanct. Is that the right word? I don't know if that's the right word, but it, it was not to be messed, it was not to be messed with. So, so I think that's where that comes from, from Gene. You could not change a line. You could not change a line, you could not change a word. I tried dutifully to make sure I did that. Now, Cole Meany and I were doing a scene together, came over to me well, we, uh, b before we shot it and said, I just want you to know I'm changing these three lines today, you know, when we shoot the scene. I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, after what I just told you, you can imagine how flabbergasted I was. I said, you're changing the writer's lines? He said, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, he, he, wasn't, he didn't want to have anything. To, he didn't want to get into a conversation over things. <laughs> He said, I'm changing this one. Uh, this one is going to be like this. And, he, and I wrote down, changed it. I said, I said, Colm, Colm, you're, you're not, there's no changing lines on Star Trek. How, how did you do that? He said, oh, 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 yeah, yeah. Well, I, I asked them, I asked them if they would change six of my lines. And we settled on three. So <laughs> negotiated. <laughs> I, 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 I couldn't do, I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll tell you, I'll tell you how, how, how sacred the lines are. Uh, I would go, if I didn't understand the line, I would go to our script supervisor, uh, Judy, Judy Brown, good old Judy Brown. And I would say, Judy, I don't understand this line. And I, I, I don't know if we should change it or not, but I don't, can you help me? And she would get them on the phone. She would get the writer on the phone, maybe not right away, but maybe they'd have to call back. But you know, I'd hear uh, I'd hear like 15 minutes later, Max Renee Echevarria is on the phone for you, and I go over and say, Renee, I don't understand this line, and he was explain it to me. They wanted to get it right. They wanted me to get it right. He would explain to me. I'd go, oh man, what a dope. Of course, yeah, okay. And that would that happened three or four times. And one time, I think it was Renee actually. I called and I said, I would like to change. This is after call. <laughs> I'm sure. I would. Wonder if I could change that this line's not making sense to me and say this. And it was a pause. And Renee said, Oh, you're right, Max. That line is a typo. <laughs> it's, it, it doesn't make any sense. Say it the way you want. <laughs> that was the only time that ever happened because it was a typo. All right. Fair enough. So, Erica. Sel what else you got for me? All right. So, Erica Sleek wants to know what it was like shooting Take Me Out to the Hollow Suite because, uh, you know, as we Folks should, as folks should know, actually, uh, you're quite adept at baseball in real life, but the character of Rom, maybe not so much. So, uh, yeah, what was it like being in that episode and not being able to actually play baseball the right way that you know how to play? Oh, it was, it was, it was a challenge. It, it was a challenge to, to come up with ways to make, I'm not the greatest ball player, but I grew up, I grew up playing baseball. That's my sport. You know, we're over in Austria now, where the sport is uh, the sport is foot of soccer. You know, I, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't grow up with soccer. I grew up with baseball. And there are baseball teams in Austria. I know this has nothing to do with your question, but uh, there are baseball teams in Austria, and uh, and I uh, hope to see them in action one day. It was great. It was great to be out with all the makeup. It was great to be outdoors on the west side, where it's cooler, closer to the ocean. That was one thing that was great about it. It was great to be kind of, I kind of had a little uh, heroic role in that episode i helped to score the one and only run yeah no it, it was it was very enjoyable uh and i love i love i just love when uh they're, they're hitting fungos they're hitting the ball you know 
and Ram is waiting, looking at the ball. I got it. I got it. I got it. I, you know, and it's it's over his head, and he doesn't. He's not even close to it. But uh, I, I loved all of it. I really, really uh, quite an enjoyable episode to be a part. Do you remember if the writers, the directors, or if any other actors had came up to talk to you about what they were doing? Since you were probably the baseball expert on set, did they have to come confer to you to get any information or any help with their stuff? No, Armin also played baseball uh, growing up, and uh, so did Aaron. The three Ferengi. The three <laughs> Ferengi figure. played baseball. What's that? Go figure, right? The Ferengis of all people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, I don't know why, uh, but yeah. I, I was having a catch with Nana, and I said, just so you know, I'm throwing left-handed. And she said, I have no idea what that means. <laughs> <laughs> just I wanted her to, I wanted her to know, I, you know, left-handed. I wasn't as accurate left-handed as I would be right-handed. So. To so her, it made no to difference. <laughs> to her, it didn't matter, no, no, anyway. <laughs> And we also mentioned we also mentioned throughout this interview that you are a very good singer. And again, the only time Rom gets to sing is in the episode uh, "The Siege of AR Five Five uh, Five Five Eight, I believe it is. Yeah, and that you get was to great. sing "The Lady Is a Tramp," but your version is "A Lady Is a Scamp." And That's right. That's yeah. Right. So, really, my question is, you know, Max Grudenchik is so good at baseball. He's so good at singing. Rom is terrible at all of these things. How how annoying <laughs> must that have been for you to do that? Not no, not at all. <laughs> well, first of all, first of all, I know that Rom is smarter than than Max. <laughs> Rom is much smarter than Max. Rom has a bigger heart than Max does. Rom, Rom is uh, a guy I, uh, in many ways, aspire to be like. He's he's uh, I, I've I've learned from playing him, so I hope I. I hope that that uh, I think in little ways it 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 ha- I get better because I uh, because of what I did is wrong. Uh, yeah. So we'll see. I hope to I hope to keep improving and move closer to who who to who Ram to who Ram was, and uh, all the bad from Max, you know, goes goes away. We had this question from a lot of different listeners, and uh, this one is from Sharonda Jones in particular. She was the first person to ask this. She wondered, Sharonda. she wants to know, what kind of Grand Nagus do you think Ram turned out to be? Oh, hi, Sharonda. I've only thought it through as far as the next few years. They go back, when the series is over, they go, uh, Lita and Ram go back to uh, Ferenginar. And I think uh, I think it would be very difficult for them to maintain power, but I think they try, and they enlist the aid of Quark and uh, uh, the the, uh, the old, old Grand Nagus Zek and uh, the the, uh, the 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 CEO of Sluggo Cola. They they have to make alliances with people. I think it would become a more I think a Rom show would be a political show. You know, something like uh, what was that? House of Cards or something, something West Wing, something like that would be the be more of a drama. You know, be more of a dr- dramatic show. I think you'd have a lot to struggle with back. I, 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 realistically, I think you'd have a lot to struggle with back on Ferengi. Yeah. So I always felt that Rom was especially interesting because you know there's so many different things I've liked about the character, but to me, I always felt like Rom is almost like the American dream on Deep Space Nine. <laughs> and he's kind of the, I know, bear with me here. This is, this is going to be a real long, pretentious that's question, a, but I got a reason for it. That's a stretch. Uh, yeah, okay. It's, yeah, I, I, it might be a little bit of a stretch, but you know, I also kind of felt that it's like the story of the American immigrant. And that's why I think Ram is the American dream, because he's a foreigner who leaves his home, seeks out a new land for new opportunity. And he doesn't first necessarily succeed, but once he leaves his comfort zone, he not necessarily assimilates, but he finds himself a new role, a new way of life, he ends up marrying a beautiful woman. He has a son who becomes the first Frankie in Starfleet, ends up being the Grand Nagus, does pretty well for himself. He has a heck of a journey, and I feel like it really is very much like an immigrant first arriving to this country, not necessarily knowing what to do with themselves, and then finding their way. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a pretentious kind of real drawn out thing, but I'm curious if you ever had any thoughts about you know looking at Rom as a whole, uh, if you've ever seen it that way. I've seen it as a guy, a character that has an incredibly incredibly wonderful story arc to play and I get to play it and uh, I like Ron uh, I get to play him what a what a what an honor what a privilege 
Um, yes, you're, everything you said is true. What, what happens to him? How, he was under, he starts out under his brother's thumb. You know, He's, he has no confidence whatsoever. And then slowly, you know, slowly he grows, he grows. And he starts to, he starts, his, his son shows a crazy interest in Starfleet Academy. And he's, he stands up for his son, he stands up for his son and he stands up for himself. With the, with, the, with the union. And it, while he's making the union, he, he meets Lita the Doppelgirl. Well, I guess they knew each other, but he, he gets together with Lita the Doppelgirl. And then he's the grand It's like you said, just a, just a, a, a wonderful thing to have to play. I can't believe they gave that to me. It's like a, like a, like a great dream. But, yeah. I just like I, we were talking about luck. Yeah, two of the first things we talked about were confidence and luck. Don't know if those th two things go together. I'm going to have to sleep on that. But uh, the luckiest son of a gun in the in the galaxy, I think. I read uh, some years ago you were working on a book, uh, supposed to be I guess memoirs. Uh, my brother's barkeep. Is that no, something you're still working on? No, no, no. That was my fan club. I had a fan club fan? for okay. a while. My brother's barkeep. Yeah, instead of my brother's keeper. Uh, instead of my brother's keeper, uh, it, was, it was my brother's barkeep. Yeah, it, it came out, it was uh, published every month or two, two months, and I would write what was going on on the show. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's all that, that's all that was. It was a, it was a newsletter for the fans. And I, was our name my brother's barkeep? I think it was. Yeah. So. Is there any chance we'll ever get a memoirs of Max Grudenchik? I'm not disciplined enough to do that. You have to really sit down and write. Armin can sit down and write. He has a new, he just had a book come out, uh, apparently. And uh, Armin can sit down and write. I don't know if we can. Yeah, I'm looking forward to reading that book. I think it's actually the first in a trilogy, in fact. So congratulations to Armin. Oh, I think so. Yeah. I think it's part of the trilogy. I don't know what part, but yeah. So last question today, Max. What is your favorite thing about being a part of the Star Trek universe? Without, I don't want to be corny, but the first thing that, comes to mind is I have to have a when I have a connection with a fan when I have a connection with a fan that's a very very nice thing and I have connections with some fans that uh, you know nowadays there's Facebook and uh, I don't know uh, Facebook and Twitter and all these other things I I, I, I am on Facebook and I, I get to uh, I get to communicate with people who are fans of the show and uh, and they uh, seem grateful uh, for that. Uh, and that's a nice feeling to have. Yeah, the, the, there, there are so, 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 so many interesting fans out there. You know, it's not all one homogeneous group with it all this way. There's just many different types of fans as there are people, you know, different types of people. And I get to, uh, I get to uh, talk with them, to meet with them, to hopefully, have, well, often have a little fun with them. It's been a lot of nice things, but that's a, that's a big one. Well, I can yeah. say on behalf of all the fans out there, we appreciate what you've contributed to the Star Trek universe, and especially just how great you've been to all the fans. I haven't had a chance to meet you in person, but uh, I feel very privileged that today I got to spend a little bit of time with you face-to-face -face via Zoom. Uh, and just spend some real quality time with an actor whose work I very much admire and uh, a human being who I very much admire. And, uh, you know, not to get too crazy out there, but they always say, don't meet your heroes. But uh, this is kind of a moment. <laughs> they, they do say that. They do. They but this do is kind of one of those moments I was hoping to do with this podcast and to get to meet the folks like yourself who I really, really admire. Uh, so it means a lot that you gave me this much time today. So thank you so much for that. And thank, thank you for chatting thank with our listeners today. Thank you for saying that, Matthew. Thank you. I mean, I got tons more questions, but we'll save it for another time. I, I know I've taken up a lot of your time as is. So uh, yeah, Max, thank you so much. This really has been great. I really, really appreciate your generosity today. Yeah, it's been, it's been wonderful to speak with you. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you for thinking of me. And uh, if you see my brother, send my regards. That was our chat with Max Grudenchik. And I hope you enjoyed listening to him as much as I did speaking with him. And by the way, I just wanted to share this moment with you guys that happened during the episode. I was asking Max a question that we ultimately cut because it was just kind of stupid. Uh, and somehow it led to him doing this. 
Sluggo cola for you and me. The cola for discriminating Ferengi. It's inexpensive, but never free. The slimiest cola in the galaxy. Drink Sluggo cola and drink a lot. Your gums will bleed and your teeth will rot. After Dabo, it hits the spot. Your movie's gonna love it, whether naked or not. I was, a, I don't know, I don't know if we, I don't know if we use that song. That was in uh, Profit and Lace, yeah. Let's see, that's the extended version of the song. <laughs> That is the extent. I think all we do, I think all we do in the episode is the call for discriminating for Randy. <laughs> so there you have it, the unabridged Sluggo Cola theme song as sung by Max Kredenchik. One of the things we sadly didn't talk about in this episode was that Max actually knows all of the rules of acquisition. And if you don't believe me, check out any videos of him from any of the Star Trek conventions out there, and you can hear him saying pretty much any of those without any hesitation. He even knows the lore behind the rules, which is pretty crazy. Hopefully we'll have a second chance to speak with Max another time. Maybe we'll go into a little bit more in depth on the rules of acquisition because yeah, with a guy like Max, there's so much more we could talk about, but there's only so many hours in the day. And of course, us being on different parts of the world made things a little bit difficult. But again, a big, big thank you to Max Redenchik for helping me live my dream of, well, talking to you. Now, for those of you wondering what happened to Rom after Star Trek Deep Space Nine, well, according to the books, Rom and Lita had a daughter named Benna and opened diplomatic relations with Bajor and Ferenginar after Bajor had joined the Federation. Quark's bar on DS9 was named the official Ferengi embassy to Bajor, which also meant that Quark got a promotion to Ferengi ambassador while still making profit on the promenade. More recently, Rom appeared in Star Trek Online as part of the Victory is Life expansion, but if you want to learn more about that one, you're going to have to play the game. Thank you again for listening to this week's episode of Trek Untold. Please make sure you follow us on social media to see all of our memes and daily guest updates. And who knows what else, because you never know what pops up on our pages. All you have to do is look for Trek Untold on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'd love to hear from you and hear what you think about this week's episode. If you'd like to support this podcast, check out patreon.com slash trekuntold to learn how you can keep our ship operating at full power. You can also check out some of our merchandise at teespring.com slash stores slash trek untold that's t-e-e spring.com that includes shirts stickers mugs phone cases and a whole lot more but most importantly if you haven't already please subscribe to this show and give us a review and rating on itunes or wherever you listen to it if you enjoy what we do here every week on this show please give us a five-star rating and review it's the best way to make new listeners discover this podcast and help us grow Once again, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Triple Fiction Productions. If you'd like to send us some feedback, suggest a guest, would like to be booked on the show, or are interested in sponsoring us, email me at trekuntold at gmail.com. Once again, this has been Trek Untold. I'm Matthew Kaplowitz, and until next time, fortune favors the bold.